Okay, I think we can start. So welcome to everyone to this webinar in the quantum industry day in Switzerland, online version. You are now in the session D on quantum sensors and we are going to introduce a little bit how things are going to happen. So uh, I'll be the, the moderator of this session. I'm from CSEM in Neuchâtel. Next to me, I have George Tudosier and he will uh, moderate the, quench, the question and answers. We are broadcasting from Zurich Technopark. Uh, it is a webinar, so you are not allowed to speak, so you are muted, but please use the question and answer chat at the top of your screen and you can ask your question and uh, we will select some of them and ask them directly to the speakers. Uh, regarding uh, the program, so we have a first part where we have three speakers. Florian Schreck, Michael Geiselman, and Sylvain Carlen. Then we'll have a small break uh, during which we will have industry pitches, one given by Gabriel, the next one by myself, and the third one by Mathieu. Then we have the second part with two talks, one from Jacek Chopinski and one from Felix Bussier. At the end, a small wrap up, and we'll be at the end of this session. So we will uh, start with the first speaker. Florian Schreck from the University of Amsterdam. He's the coordinator of the IQClock project and he will talk about his project and also the industry perspective of the IQClock project. Florian, the floor is yours. You can share your screen. Yes, thank you Jacques for this introduction and very much for inviting me to this quantum industry day so that I can present our IQ Clock project, which is a quantum flagship project and its industry perspective. So we are building an integrated optical lattice clock uh, with our industry partners. And we are also trying to simplify optical clocks. Now, before explaining optical clocks, I want to take a step back and compare quantum sensors with classical sensors here. Okay, so imagine you live a few hundred years ago and the king orders you to build the best clock in the world. Then you will probably use a pendulum as your frequency reference, which is a big man-made object. And you can never build two pendula which tick at exactly the same frequency. And if because of that one day, the king is late for his appointment with the queen, then you have a problem. So luckily we live in a quantum world and the quantized energy levels of atoms provide you with perfect frequency references, namely the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation needed to drive transitions in these atoms. And these quantum sensors have a lot of advantages every atom of a specific isotope is identical to each other, as far as we know. And they are very small, we can build miniaturized sensors. We can also use several atoms and engineer quantum states to be very sensitive to the desired quantity, like the flow of time, and less sensitive to other quantities, such as the magnetic field. And we can not only use atoms as our quantum sensors, molecules and V centers, hot atoms, our ultra-cold atoms, trapped ions, they make all very nice sensors for many different things. Now I'll concentrate on the measurement of time. So if you want to build the best atomic clock in the world, then you have to carefully choose the atomic transition you use, your clock transition. It should have a high frequency, so it should be an optical transition, and it should have a narrow line with millihertz, would be nice. And you want to get a large signal out of your atoms. So you should use many atoms, but they may not disturb each other. So you should use a guess of individual atoms. Now a guess usually at room temperature, the, the atoms and molecules, they move around with hundreds of meters per second velocity. And that's bad because through the Doppler effect, you get huge frequency shifts. So we need to cool our atoms essentially to stand still. And this is done inside such vacuum chambers. We have here an oven emitting an atomic beam with hundreds of meters per second velocity. And from the other side, we use 
a laser beam resonant with the atomic transition. And each time an atom scatters a photon from this laser beam, the atom will obtain the momentum of this photon and slow down a little bit. And then when the atoms arrive in the center, we have more laser cooling beams to collect the atomic cloud in the middle of the vacuum chamber and cool the atoms to microkelvins. And then the atoms are ready to be captured in a so-called optical lattice, like eggs in an egg carton. And they are essentially then standing still. And to interrogate the clock transition, we send a laser beam onto the atoms and measure if the atoms get excited to the upper clock state or not. If they get excited, the laser has just the right frequency. If they don't, we adjust the laser's frequency a little bit. Now, all that remains to be done is to use an optical frequency comp to translate the like 400 terahertz optical frequencies of our clock laser into the microwave frequency regime in which we can do something useful uh, with these clocks in which electronics can use the signal. Now, what can we do with these optical clocks? You might remember the movie Interstellar, where astronauts approach a black hole and they then age at very different rates. Now, we don't have a black hole near Earth, but we have these super good optical lattice clocks. So our colleagues in Boulder built two such clocks and compared their relative frequency. And here you see the measurement result. And then they took one of these clocks and forklifted it up by 30 centimeters. And then they compared the frequencies again. And you see, it's different. They measure here the gravitational redshift. And let's compare the performance of this lab optical lattice clock from 10 years ago to the best commercial clocks and to what we have today. So here, all commercial atomic clocks are interrogating microwave transitions, so 10 gigahertz range. We have here chip scaled clocks, beam tube clocks, and Mucons even makes an ultra cold cesium atom clock. And the precision is impressive, 10 to the minus 14, a height difference of 100 meters. But the best lab clocks nowadays have 10 to the minus 18 equivalent to a height difference of one centimeter. Or if you want, these clocks would go wrong by only one second over the lifetime of the universe. And we are now starting to build integrated industry clocks with a performance in the 10 to the minus 15, 16 level. What could we do if we had such industry clocks? They are readily available. Our colleague Hidetoshi Katori from Japan has a project in which he wants to build a network of such clocks all across Japan connected with telecom fibers to compare the frequencies. And then you see gravity changing at these different locations. You can see if a volcanic magma chamber is filling up or if the groundwater level changes or, and so on. You also know that clocks are very important for GPS. Navigation works with timing signals sent down by satellites. And we can, of course, put such optical clocks in satellites, but I think there are simpler schemes in which optical clocks can improve GPS. Imagine you have a cargo vessel in the ocean and a pirate wants to have the cargo. So the pirate could just send fake GPS signals to the vessel, which then would mistake where it is and the pirate is really intelligent, it could make the vessel move to it. And such things have happened with like a drone taken down by, by Iran a few years ago. And now imagine, and then of course the pirate is very happy. And now imagine what would have happened if the cargo vessel would have an optical clock on board it would have simply seen that something's wrong with GPS, these signals make no sense, and it would have stayed on course and all you are left with is a sad pirate. Uh, clocks are also important for network synchronization. If our cell phone networks would fail, we would use billions of euros per day. And um, these networks are synchronized through GPS and optical clocks can potentially help there to improve the GPS hold over time, the time uh, after GPS um, failure or that you can last outlast a GPS failure 
perhaps enable GPS free operation and synchronize with higher precision. And that might ultimately enable also terrestrial navigation or telecom networks with higher data rate. Now, clocks are for sure not the only thing needed to make this work, but they could be an important component. Now, we have founded the IQ Clock Consortium to bring these optical lattice clocks from the lab to society, and we want to help also to kickstart a European optical clock industry. We have about 70 members, one third of them PhD students and postdocs. We posed ourselves two challenges. We want to take these big optical lattice clocks, which fill a whole lab room and take two PhD students or three to operate, into a, a small, robust format made and tested by industry. And we want to develop a better, simpler clock operation scheme. Now, I want to speak about the first challenge, and I need to first explain you a little bit more what you need to build on lattice clocks. So I will explain you the scheme again, but with more detail. We have two laser cooling stages, needing two laser systems. We have to trap these atoms here, and we need a clock laser to interrogate them. Every time we interrogate, the atoms are lost, and we need to prepare a new sample. During that time, the laser has no reference, and lasers are nasty. They have no reference, they drift away in frequency. So we need uh, short-term frequency reference, an ultra-stable optical resonator, and we need the frequency comp. Now we have partners which specialize in all these things, and together we integrate all these components. The laser systems are put into REC formats by Toptica, NKT Photonics, and Birmingham. The vacuum chamber has already been simplified by Birmingham and is further going to be simplified by Teledyne E2V for the last version of the clock. Electronics is simplified by Toptica and Teledyne E2V and everything is assembled in the quantum hub at Birmingham and then the final clock will be field trialed in a research network node of British Telecom. And the second goal we have is to simplify the operation scheme of clocks, yes. So we, have, we don't want atoms only intermittently available. We want to have them available all the time. We don't want this ultra-stable resonator, which is really difficult to operate on a moving vehicle. Um, and this all can be achieved by not operating the clock in this passive mode, where you prepare atoms and then send a laser beam onto them and interrogate the atoms. You can make an active clock by teasing a beam of atoms to emit photons on the clock transition into a cavity. This is very similar to a normal laser, but I mean, it is a laser, but not a normal laser. It's something else. So in a normal laser, you have atoms in the optically excited state emitting photons into the cavity by stimulated emission for which you need a huge electric field in this cavity. And that only works if you make a very narrow line cavity and that means the frequency of your laser is determined by the distance between the cavity mirrors, not really the atoms. If the cavity mirrors shake, the frequency of the laser shakes. Now, we will store the frequencies, or we will gain the frequency stability from the ensemble spin of the atoms. And the cavity is only there to tease emission, not by a stimulated emission, but by something called superradiance. And then if the cavity shakes, nothing matters. The frequency will be stable. And we need to develop a whole new, a slew of new things. And that's what we are doing. We used machines we had already to prove that we can get the high flux of atoms. We showed pulse superradiance. We develop theory and design our machines. And now we are in full swing of the construction of these novel superradiant clocks. Now let's take a step back and look at the history of atomic clock development. The first atomic clock was demonstrated in 1953, a microwave clock, integrated and industrialized in the 60s. And today we have a whole slew of such microwave clocks used everywhere. Optical atomic clocks have been developed in the 2000s. It was only seven years ago that optical atomic clocks exceeded the performance of microwave clocks. And now already they are 100 times better than the best microwave clocks. And we are starting the industrialization of these clocks. And I think over the next years, we will get to commercial optical atomic clocks and hopefully expand the market uh, more and more. And we are just at the beginning of this road. There are lots of more questions that need to be addressed beyond what we can do in this three and a half year IQ clock project. We need even more compact laser sources, more reliable laser systems, photonic chips, perhaps, 
we will have a talk on this just later. And we need to think more about commercial applications. So what's going to be the first killer application? Defense, perhaps, and telecom? We need to discuss this. And therefore, we are going to have an IQ clock industry day in a industrial park at British Telecom in March, or on, yeah, it might be online, of course. And we want to discuss with potential end users and potential partners for the second and third stage of the quantum flagship for further integration. And uh, we can discuss all of this. And also in my lab in Amsterdam, I'm not only developing super rating clocks, we are also developing uh, the first hope, I mean, hopefully developing the first continuous super rate um, atom laser for atom interferometry. We use ultra rubidium strontium molecules for quantum simulation and individual strontium atoms for quantum computing. We can discuss all of this now or if you send me an email in Zoom. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Florian, for this very enthusiastic talk. And uh, I guess we have some questions, uh, George. The questions are coming slowly in, but I would uh, dare to take the first position and ask uh, what is the limit? So 10 to the minus 18, is this the end or is, is there the next uh, version? And uh, how does it scale with the cost? Uh, you can see it in the size, there is a lab right. to, mm -hmm. to, to reach 10 to the minus 18. What would that mean in terms of, do you see it in 10 years as being part of our cell phone or is it, uh, <laughs> is it far away? No, I that? mean, so our clock now with IQ clock uh, wants to go to 10 to the minus 16 only. The best clocks in the world are 10 to the minus 18 and they take care of a lot of issues which we ignore in IQ clock. So you, you have your background radiation, just thermal radiation, shifting the clock uh, frequency around, collisions with background gas molecules, uh, shifting it around, electric field stability. There are lots, and, and also the quality of the reference ultra stable resonator, all of this comes into play. And there's a clear path towards at least a, a, a precision, perhaps not an absolute accuracy, but at least a precision of 10 to the minus 19 by increasing atom number, increasing these reference uh, resonators going to cryogenic resonators, silicon monocrystalline cavities and so on. It's really exciting. And I didn't speak about this at all, but there are really exciting fundamental physics questions that we can attack when we go there. The cost? Yeah, I guess IQ clock, if you order 10 of them, you can get them for a million apiece. But uh, the 10 to the minus 18 level, no. I mean, that, uh, that's, <laughs> that's more in the skill of the students that you have. There are only very few people in the world know how to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. There is a question now for, from Kaitanya. I hope I, um, I spelled it correctly. What are the typical specs for a clock laser, as you mentioned? There, is there a need for compact laser? I think this is a very broad and general, and you address it a little bit with a optical. It could be a more technical. What does a laser, such a compact laser, need to do? Mm -hmm. Okay, so at first I described the optical lasers. They are just extended cavity diode lasers. And for the clock laser, they need to be narrowed down as much as you can. So in our system, that will be Hertz level. In the best clocks in the world, it's 10 millihertz level. And uh, that depends more on the ultra stable resonator than on the clock laser itself. Now, if you want to go beyond that, put them on satellites or mass manufacture them, um, you know, you, you need to somehow chip integrate these laser systems. And I'm not a specialist on, on, uh, uh, on this topic. But I mean, there's no requirement in power. A few milliwatts is enough, but it has to be very stable. Uh, I think I'm online also, yeah. Uh, I just want to, to ask the participants to use the question and answer. Uh, chat which is at the bottom or the top of your window to ask your questions. I think we would have time for one more if there is one more, otherwise I would also have one. There is one which you already addressed, which is uh, um, very interesting to see things like magma uh, monitoring and the uh, Gianni de la Rosa asks, what are also additional commercial applications? Where do you see as, as potential bigger markets or uh, uh, similar, similar impacts like the microwave clocks did? Mm -mm. Yeah, it of course depends on the price and the reliability that we can ultimately achieve. So let's let's just stick with the price tag which we have today. That's a million euro, perhaps with mass production, a few hundred thousand euros. 
I think, I mean, of definitely, yeah, defense. I mean, it make, makes total sense to put such clocks on aircraft carriers or perhaps expensive cargo vessels. Um, then, um, yeah, underground exploration. And then telecom, perhaps, but our clocks are kind of too good. So we have to wait till telecom needs uh, this precision. There's always talking about making terrestrial navigation available with telecom networks, so centimeter level precision navigation for autonomous cars, for example. And there, you need better clocks and or better network synchronization. So that goes hand in hand there. I think um, we, we need to build a first test network with these clocks and really good fiber frequency distribution of these clock signals. And I hope that in discussions with industry partners, we will, we will see more and more applications. It's a, yeah, my, my friends compared it to having built the first smartphones. Nobody knew that apps, you know, software on smartphones would be such a huge market. Now we provide the first, this hardware, this platform. So please people think about what can be done with this extreme uh, precision. Thanks so much, Florian, uh, for your, all your answers and for your talk. And we all hope that atomic clocks of that good frequency stability that you have will once enter the market when the price will go down. So thank you very much. We are now moving to our next speaker. Um, let me uh, show the agenda. So our next speaker will be uh, Michael Geiselmann from Ligen Tech in Switzerland. And he will talk about integrated low-loss silicon nitride for quantum sensing. So, Mikhail, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, that was a, already a very good introduction uh, to, to, to my talk. And, and uh, my, my talk uh, focuses actually on the further, further integration of... Um, of systems uh, using photonic integrated circuits, and uh, and here, um, if you if you want to build uh, photonic integrated circuits, especially for for quantum applications, um, every photon counts. Uh, if you want to use that for entanglement, for example, and here you you need very very low losses, uh, which uh, which we can provide with a with a platform where the waveguides are made of uh, silicon nitride. And um, just as a as a motivation, uh, in the year 1998 um, at Max Planck Institute, uh, um, Ted Hensch uh, got uh, uh, got the Nobel Prize for 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 having a um, the the optical frequency comp, which was an octave spanning a comp with what with what that you can use as a kind of clock network uh, uh, clockwork. Uh, to um, to to stabilize uh, these these optical clocks. In in the year uh, twenty uh, two thousand eight, then uh, then Menlo Systems, uh, which was a, a spin off from from that group, uh, built the first commercial commercial system. And uh, and nowadays we have um, you can buy a frequency co uh, comp from from several companies. And um, but where we see uh, the future and, and what has been shown in uh, in a project uh, named Course with uh, uh, with um, universities uh, from from the US, but also here uh, the EPFL in, in in Lausanne, that you can also create a, a comp, a octave spanning comp that is uh, at the moment uh, free running in such a device that is not uh, not larger than uh, than uh, than your than your palm of the of the hand so we see we see a uh, big potential in in photonic integration and i want to to quickly motivate uh, why photonic integration is uh, is very interesting for uh, for quantum applications it's um, what already was addressed in the in the first talk not only about uh, size, weight, uh, and power, but it's also about uh, robustness. That uh, that you don't have movable parts uh, in in your in your optical circuit. And if you want to scale it up, so if you want a certain volume, then then it also scales with with cost. And for those um, who are not very familiar with photonic integration, uh, I just put two slides in here. 
So a bulk uh, beam splitter looks like that uh, with a centimeter range of, uh, of size. Uh, then if, if you go to a fiber, you already go down in, in size, but, uh, but it's very, depends how you touch the fiber. It's, it's uh, not uh, very stable, but in photonic integration, you can go to a few hundreds of micron uh, with ratio to tolerances that are, that are much smaller than, uh, than in fibers. Uh, with having then beam splitters, you can also build Marzena interferometers uh, with a very precise con uh, control of the, of the face and especially the, the path lengths, because this is done with, uh, with lithography me methods that are, can be controlled down to, the, uh, to some nanometer level. And, uh, and with that, you have a very good control of the, of the path lengths error. You can also do um, uh, multiplexes and demultiplexes and beam combiners with, for example, array waveguide gratings or, or ring resonators uh, to, to have a very compact um, MUX and uh, DMUX team in, in, your, in your system. So what is, uh, what is that photonic integration um, how can you how can you access it and, and, and what does that mean? So there's a whole uh, uh, industry of, of photonic integration, which uh, which uh, starts from design softwares and design houses to chip manufacturing, packaging, module integration, and system integration. And our our focus is on the on the chip manufacturing that we have developed the uh, uh, technology. Uh, based on the silicon nitride that can uh, that can support your development from from prototype uh, up to up to volume production the the key element of uh, of our technology is that we that we have our the optical mode um, fully uh, fully concentrated in in the waveguide so this this black thing here is, uh, is the silicon nitride optical waveguide, which assures you very, very uh, low losses, very small uh, low face errors and the very, very uh, small footprint. And all that is needed if you, if you want to, um, to, to engineer a, a quantum circuit, which I will explain afterwards. So silicon nitride can be can be seen as, uh, it's the same family as, as silicon photonics, but with our addition of that uh, high confinement uh, mode, it, uh, it can be seen as, uh, as silicon photonics plus wide transparency, how high power handling uh, and, and very low loss. And with uh, just to show quickly cross sections, what can be done with, with such uh, photonic integration, you can have uh, so-called rip wave guides, you can have Heater integration to heat your 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 nitride. You can have uh, uh, cladding openings. That's uh, so. This one here is is the nitride waveguide. This is the 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 oxide, and this is the uh, a silicon wafer where all the all the these steps are are processed on. If you have, add an a heater, you can you can tune, for example, a ring resonator. You can tune the resonance. You can tune the phase shift of a, of a Marzenda interferometer and that with, uh, with very good uh, accuracies. And so as we are a, a, a manufacturing partner of, uh, of silicon nitride photonic integrated circuits, we offer this, uh, this fabrication to, to our customers either in, in custom runs or in so-called multiple project wafer runs where several customers share the cost of uh, one wafer fabrication and then get, uh, get a minimum uh, seven chips to, to, to start um, implementing photonic integration in their systems. And uh, the last, um, uh, the, the, the second half of the talk, I, I would like to, to go into quantum examples where this photonic integration makes sense for, for quantum applications. And here again, the, the, the motivation to, to use photonic integration is that you don't have any movable parts. So you have a very good phase stability. 
you have very small sized uh, components so everything in can be integrated in a in a chip so the, the system uh, um, volume goes down uh, by a lot and you can you can scale in volume uh, if uh, if if that is if that is needed and here's for an example of uh, of a large uh, integrated system realized with uh, with with photonic uh, integration where where the where you have um, a lot of these uh, um, uh, beam splitters what what I uh, what I showed before and integrated with with um, in Marzender interferometers with tunable phase shifters uh, here the, the the heaters in in um, in yellow that uh, that can shift your face and and that uh, that whole system uh, then can uh, can do a, a photon uh, pair generation and and uh, here <clears throat> photon separation and uh, and operation and, and analysis you you can also uh, use uh, photonic integration for uh, quantum key distribution uh, and then in this paper, it was shown um, from, a, from an indium phosphide. So this is a, a different platform that has uh, where you can where you can uh, build lasers with and uh, and modulators. Uh, you you couple that to a to a silicon nitride uh, receiver where you have integrated your your phase shifters and uh, and delay lines. And uh, and detectors uh, to to uh, to do um, a QKD system on a on an integrated photonic chip. And um, and now I switch to to examples that uh, that were done with uh, with our chips. So um, one uh, one customer they uh, they did uh, they recently published a, a paper. About uh, spontaneous four-wave mixing uh, that allows uh, photon pair generation, uh, where they where they squeeze light uh, with a chip and do and do um, quantum uh, quantum experiments with that. And to do uh, four-wave mixing on a chip, what you need is a very uh, a very high Q. So here we have a, a waveguide and uh, and a resonator, and this resonator has a very uh, high quality factor. And the expected uh, photon pair generation rate scales with a uh, with the third power of of the Q. So the higher the Q, the the higher uh, the the photon rate that uh, that you generate uh, out of your your pump photon, you generate two new uh, photons at uh, at uh, at two new uh, wavelengths. And this was uh, last week um, uh, published on the on the cover of uh, of Science Advanced. But it's not uh, it's not only only squeezing what you can what you can do with uh, with these uh, um, high Q resonators. You can also have um, a whole frequency comp generated with uh, with such a high Q resonator. And in this case, we 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 built we built here this uh, this this ring resonator. Uh, that can be pumped uh, with a with a CW laser, and by the the fact that you have here a, a Chi three material, the the silicon nitride, you can you can establish a whole uh, octave spanning uh, frequency comp that is that is uh, F to F uh, self referenced, and that that is used in in this case in in this architecture uh, to um, and to be locked to a to a rubidium uh, vapor cell, and that whole that whole system can be integrated in in a, in a photonic integrated circuit. So this is uh, this is on a silicon nitride platform. Uh, such a resonator at the moment is is still in a in a silicon uh, silica platform, but can also be integrated in a silicon nitride platform. Um, there is efforts that uh, that we that we have to integrate the photodiode on on our platform, and also to get uh, several wavelengths on uh, on one chip. And this and here, silicon nitride has a has a true advantage because uh, it is transparent from 400 nanometers up to uh, up to three to four micron, 
uh, so you can you can uh, propagate uh, several wavelengths on uh, on one chip. Um, so frequency comp generation is 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 one thing, but you can also uh, generate a, a super continuum generation uh, super continuum. Uh, if you have a pulsed uh, femtosecond laser, for example, you can uh, you can generate different uh, broad uh, or not so broad spectra um, with dispersive wave emissions that you can then link again with uh, atomic transition um, for your for your atomic clock. And uh, with this, I, I would like to, to thank the organizers um, to, to organize this, uh, this, this great event. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm open to, to take uh, questions. Thanks so much, uh, Michael, for this very interesting talk. Good transition from the IQ clock to your talk and also to the next one. I think the question and answer chat is going growing. So, George, some questions? Yes, please, uh, please use the Q&A. Um, we, we increase the number of uh, questions and uh, I would like to share two questions, perhaps from uh, Krishna and Kartik, which go in the same direction as our last visit uh, a, few, a few time ago. It's um, what kind of um, tools do you typically use for designing uh, or the pre-design, what kind of tools must be uh, used in order to be compliant with your with, 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 with your interface? And if I may complete that question, how would you would you share a little bit of knowledge where is the small nitty details like the coupling into the T10 mode? Is this easy done? Can you just use a simple um, simulator tool and then you and, and your platform? Is it running smooth? Yeah, so so to 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 answer the 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 first question, so so as I as I mentioned here, probably but quickly, so there's a whole um, uh, environment of of different uh, software providers where you can where you can simulate, for example, the Miracle uh, can can do building block uh, simulations with uh, with FTDT simulations as well as uh, Synopsys. Um, then Synopsis and Lucida go then to the next level where they uh, where they provide you um, a tool how to how to make the layout of uh, of such a chip. So here we are in the component uh, level, like a building block, for example, a, a beam splitter. Uh, then here we go to the level to combine several building blocks on a on a layout basis that that we receive them to be fabricated. And then uh, VPI Photonics, for example, is, is then a software uh, where you go to a system level, uh, which is seen here. So you have, um, you have uh, only the, 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 the components and the system response will be, will be simulated afterwards. And, um, and what, uh, what, you, uh, what you asked, um, I need to check if I, yeah, so, so uh, for example, how, how much, how accurate is that, what you simulate and what you, what you, put, uh, what you measure in the end. So here, for example, we, um, with, together with our partner, VLC uh, Photonics, uh, we designed, uh, fabricated and measured uh, um, 7228 splitter. Uh, and uh, the the measurement was at 70.8 and 29.2, and and uh, I think that is for the first time uh, that was the first fabrication uh, that we did, and then we do more and more uh, fabrication runs to to get statistics out of uh, out of these building blocks. But the first time right is is possible, and uh, so the, the the match between the, the the simulation tool and the fabrication is is very good. Thank you, Michael. This is really impressive. Uh, the, coupler, the couplers and the, uh, the numbers you showcase here, it is like if you come from microwave, this is impressive to see it in the optical done in the first run like that. Um, perhaps in the same direction, there is another question asking about defects in your material. How much do they affect? I would relate it perhaps to the question of the Q, the generation of photons in the in the in the ring resonator, is there something like a limitation of the material in terms of defects, or is the Q 
scale? Uh, does it scale into a direction if your process is improving? Uh, so, so yes, of the the the, the losses. So, so losses is directly related with uh, with um, with the quality factor. So, the material absorption uh, that uh, is is mitigated that we are using um, uh, LPCVD silicon nitride, and and then of course every every impurity that uh, that you might have either in the in the nitride or in the surrounding oxide will will affect uh, the, uh, the the losses and the q factor and and we are we are working to uh, to so to get the losses even higher even that um, at the moment as a commercially available uh, platform this is one of the uh, this is, i think the the, the best uh, cues that uh, that that we get Okay, thank you very much, Michael, for your answers and for your talk. For sure, PICs are going to be more and more used, and we are also happy to see that they will be used for atomic clocks too. So, um, we'll go to the, our next speaker. So, our next speaker will be uh, Sylvain Carlen from uh, CSEM, and he will tell you what's going on about quantum sensors at CSEM. So, Sylvain, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jacques. Okay, uh, so yeah, as I said, I uh, will present you um, our work on uh, quantum sensors at CSEM, and in particular, the work carried out in the European project uh, Maximal, for which uh, CSEM is a coordinator. Uh, so here is the outline of uh, my talk. Uh, I will not introduce CSEM as uh, I guess Jacques will or has uh, already taken care of that. Uh, but I will start by introducing the origin of our work on quantum sensors by uh, speaking about our work on uh, ab about the history of uh, time measurement in, uh, in Neuchâtel. Um, I will then uh, give you some details on our core technology that we use for atomic sensing, that is to say the MEMS uh, atomic vapor cells. Uh, I will then go in more details about the Maximal projects, uh, so these projects we're coordinating, and I will finish uh, by speaking about two uh, important examples of quantum sensors that we're uh, participating to the development. Um, so, as I was saying, um, our work at CSEM on quantum sensing originates from an old history of uh, time measurement in Neuchâtel. Uh, in Neuchâtel, we have a, a whole ecosystem of different entities that work on time and frequency, as you can see on the left of, of my slide. So, at one end, uh, we have the University of Neuchâtel that carries out the basic research. At the other end, we have uh, the industry uh, that produces and sells uh, atomic clocks. And we at CSCM position ourselves in between as a bridge uh, between academy and this industry. Uh, most of these uh, different actors come from a common ancestor uh, that is the former observatory of Neuchâtel. Uh, which was responsible for giving the time in Switzerland in, until 2007. Uh, here you have some examples of the realization of this ecosystem. Uh, so the passive hydrogen masers and uh, the rubidium atomic frequency standards are, are two uh, examples that are currently flying on Galileo satellites. And uh, the last example on the, on the right of my slide is the Swiss miniature atomic clocks that we are currently developing within Maximal and that uh, we'll talk about in more details in the, in the following minutes. Uh, just to mention it, uh, so also originating from, the, from this expertise uh, in, uh, in the observatory of Neuchâtel, we also have a lot of expertise at CSM in photonics in more general with uh, subjects such as uh, non-classical light sources in the, in the, the European fog and uh, uh, super twin projects, uh, narrow and stable lasers, 
complete optical systems. Here you have an example of a spectrometer that is used to detect methane in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, also frequency combs, and, uh, and we also are working with uh, peak devices, uh, also in collaboration with uh, Legendtech, and uh, high power lasers. But let me come to the, to the core of my, of my talk and the, the real subject of it uh, with the MEMS atomic vapor cells. So first of all, what is a, a MEMS uh, atomic vapor cells? Uh, well, uh, basically it's a sandwich of, uh, of glass, silicon and glass with a hole in the silicon. And this hole is filled with uh, an alkali metal. In our case, most of the times it's rubidium and some gas. And um, at CSCM, we fabricate these, uh, these cells at the wafer level using uh, microfabrication technologies. Uh, meaning that we can reduce the cost of fabrication and add functionalization to the cell. So with one uh, fabrication run, so with one wafer, we can produce a few hundreds of cells uh, depending on their, on their size and on the size of the wafer. So how do we do that? Uh, so we start with a silicon wafer we etch uh, silicon holes in the in the silicon by DRIE. We then bond a first uh, glass window at the bottom of the of the silicon. We fill the cell with the uh, aqueous uh, rubidium azide, so it's a salt that solves in water. We let it dry. Then we bond a second glass uh, used at the uh, at the top window under under argon. And uh, so we, we seal, in fact, the KIT, and then we activate the, the rubidium azide with UV light. So we decompose it into uh, metallic rubidium and gaseous nitrogen. So along the years, we have uh, been doing a lot of different cells, and we have gained experience in all the steps of uh, fabrication, starting from the design the fabrication itself, you have here uh, pictures of our clean room and of, uh, of our UV radiation system. But also on the characterization of the cell, you have here a few examples of cells that we, that we produce. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that we have deposited three different patents uh, on these technologies uh, that are listed here. Okay, um, let's come now to the maximal project itself in which we're currently pushing the development of uh, these atomic sensors. Uh, so it's a project that is part of the quantum flagship. Um, it gathers 14 partners in Europe, uh, eight academic groups, uh, four SMEs and two RTOs such as CSCM to bridge the gap between uh, between academics and uh, industry. Uh, the objectives of the, of the project are the, the following. So they are all built around the common platform, which is the MEM cell that I, that I presented just before. Uh, so we are aiming to build optically pumped magnetometers for encephalographic, encephalographic uh, magnetic field measurements, miniature atomic clocks, uh, miniature atomic gyroscopes for autonomous vehicles, uh, atomic gigahertz and terahertz sensors uh, for uh, for imaging of uh, of, uh, of uh, our, uh, terahertz and gigahertz field, and finally uh, Rydberg based gas sensors. So for four of these uh, objectives. The goal in Maximal is really to build a prototype or something that goes close to a product. So we have these four high TRL uh, objectives for, for these four uh, uh, sensors, but also for each of them and also for the uh, Rydberg uh, based gas sensors, we have lower TRL objectives in which we try to explore new, new technologies as well as uh, quantum enhancement. Uh, in the end of my talk, I'll give more details on two of these uh, sensors, that is to say the atomic clock and the atomic gyroscope. So let's start with the atomic clock. 
So our development in Maximal follow our early development on, on miniature atomic clocks that have uh, been done in the last decade and also financed by ESA and, uh, and the Swiss government. So how does an atomic clock in the way we, we build it uh, work? Well, we start with a, an atomic vapor cell filled with rubidium. We put it in a thermally controlled and uh, magnetically controlled environment. Uh, we shine a laser through this cell. We detect the, the light coming out of it with a photodiode. Then we lock the laser frequency to the atomic absorption of the, of the cell. So this is just to control the, the laser frequency. And then we add a second loop, which is the, the clock loop. And here we modulate the, the laser with an RF frequency at exactly the hyperfan frequency of the, of the rubidium. And we lock this uh, RF frequency to a minimum of, um, of absorption. So that way we lock a quartz, in fact, to the, to the hyperfan frequency of rubidium of the atom. And uh, we then get an output signal that is linked to the atoms, so a stable output signal. So how do we do that in practice? Well, uh, here is a sketch of our prototype. You can recognize here the cell, the laser, and the photodiode. And to route the laser light from the laser through the cell uh, to the photodiode, we use a waveguide. So this allows us to have a very thin and the compact um, packaging for our uh, our miniature clock. You have here the dimensions of the of it, so it's a few centimeters and a few millimeters in thickness. Uh, here are a bit, uh, some more uh, pictures of the actual device. So this was done uh, by CSM in collaboration with VTT and Spectra Time and also with ESA, and we're still uh, continuing the development of that within the, the Project Maximal. Uh, an interesting technology that we are uh, developing for these clocks are gold micro disks. So this is really related to the, the atomic vapor cell itself. Uh, we've seen that one of the main a uh, source of instability within the clock was linked to the presence of rubidium droplets, so really metallic droplets inside the cell cavity that interfere with the laser light. And as a solution, we've proposed and patented uh, the use of uh, gold micro disks inside the, the cell uh, cavity. And these gold micro disks allow to condensate the rubidium droplets and the, at the at the chosen space inside the cell, and therefore to in increase the clock frequency stability. So you have here a few graphs that, um, that compare uh, clock frequency stability with and without the mac these micro disks, and you can see in red uh, our results with it. Uh, we have also tested these micro disks in a commercial clock of spectra time. So not the, um, the prototype I've described before, but one, one of these, their uh, commercial clock. And we have been able to, to show results uh, equaling word best performances in terms of uh, long-term frequency stability and drift with MEM cells. So stability is below 10 to the minus 11 per day. So drift values below 10 to the minus 11 per day. Uh, the second subject I wanted to talk about is uh, NMR gyroscopes. So these developments uh, follow our initial work in the frame of uh, uh, a project uh, called Navisas, where the goal was to develop gyroscopes for small aircrafts. So in, um, in Maximal, uh, we're collaborating with Bosch. And the goal here is to um, is uh, to develop uh, gyroscopes for uh, autonomous uh, driving vehicles. I think you already had a talk on that this morning, but maybe I'll, uh, I'll repeat uh, a few things. 
So the goal here is to, to keep the direction of an autonomous vehicle without an external reference. And for that, that you need a stable rotation reference. And you cannot use standard MEMS gyroscopes because they're not stable enough. So you need to develop a, an alternative technology. And that uh, alternative technology is an NMR gyroscope. So in that case, we use the precession of xenon in a magnetic field as a gyroscope. So xenon for a given magnetic field has a given Larmor precession. And when the, the whole system rotates, uh, this precession is, uh, this frequency is slightly shifted by the rotation rate. So we detect this precession by, uh, by reading by rubidium. So what we do is we pump the, the xenon by spin exchange uh, optical pumping. Then we let it precess in, uh, in the, the magnetic field. And we then read the, the polarization of xenon by the rubidium that we use also for, for pumping, but here used as a magnetometer. Uh, so within Maximal, the role of CSCM here was first to produce the atomic vapor salts with xenon, which we did our, with our uh, patented uh, technology that I described before. And the second goal was also to contribute to the laboratory demonstration of the gyroscope on two main topics. The first one being the measurement of rubidium and xenon spin coherence uh, time and the other being the development uh, of interrogation scheme to improve the system bandwidth, which is a very important uh, parameter for, for gyroscope. I'm already coming to an end of my, of my presentation, but I just want to wrap up a bit and make a small summary. So I've shown you our background in atomic clock and how it led to our uh, expertise in um, in uh, quantum sensors. I've uh, described uh, how we, we, are, we mastered the development of small series of vapor cells uh, and their fabrication techniques. And I've then uh, described the maximum project, which is centered around these uh, MEMS atomic vapor cells. And within these projects, we're developing, as I said, pre-products, prototypes and demonstrators of a third generation of quantum devices. But also we're exploring quantum enhancements and potential uh, improvement of these, of these uh, quantum devices through theoretical analysis and proof of principle demonstration. I still want to thank our funding agencies and if you want to know more about our activities, I invite you to visit our website or contact me directly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Silva, for this talk. And we all hope that these prototypes come so on to, to products that we will find on the market. I guess we have some questions from the chat and George. Thank you, Sylvan. I, it was impressive to see uh, the talk in the morning uh, and now to see the nitty details of, uh, of the pioneer in the field. Uh, there is a question in going in this direction from Krishna, which is asking, uh, how, are the, how is the cavity realized? Is it etched in silicon? Is it actually empty or do you, do you fill it with something? So I've described the, the fabrication uh, principle here. Uh, so yeah, this cavity is filled with uh, with two things, in fact, uh, with rubidium first. So it's really our, in the case of the clock, it's really our uh, reference. And then it's also filled with argon and uh, nitrogen. Uh, so these two gases are used as buffer gas to, to improve the coherence time of, of the rubidium atoms. So the cavity, as I said, is uh, is built by uh, deep reactive ion etching of silicon, and then uh, it's uh, it's sealed at both ends by by a glass wafer, and the filling is realized by this uh, patented technique 
So this uh, rubidium azide uh, UV decomposition that is described here. Thank you, Sylvan. This is, I think, what the question was aiming for. Uh, perhaps a question from my side where I'm I'm, I'm really like, I see the developments in this direction coming from, from you as being a pioneer. How do you see the development in order to get it inside of a car? Uh, what kind of size reduction you, you, you could aim for more when you talk about gyros? What about cost? Do you think is a scalable uh, technology which will be like replacing MEMS and other things in, 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 um, easily? And what kind of resources do you need? More quantum engineers like from ETH or uh, what are the bottlenecks in, in, in getting this thing in everybody's uh, cell phone? So about the gyroscope, I think the system itself is more complex than a, than a simple MEMS gyroscope. So I don't think we will see a, a MEMS, I mean, an atomic based MEMS uh, gyroscope in a cell phone in the near future, because it uh, it does require lasers, quite a complex electronics behind. So in the near future, I don't I don't, don't foresee it uh, in a smartphone. For for autonomous vehicles, on the other hand, I think, as far as I understood the subject, I'm really not a, an expert in the application itself. But uh, as far as I understood, I think that uh, this is some kind of must have a better gyroscope than a, than a MEMS for, for the engineers driving. You will not have the MEMS. So maybe Jacques can, can also back me up on that question. It must be a bit more than me. No, for sure. Uh, the goal is to reduce the costs. <clears throat> a gyro is a complex system, but with a partner like Bosch, we are pretty sure that they have the resources and they have the knowledge and the infrastructure to make it happen. So it will take some time for sure. And let's say, we would say in the next five to 10 years, we hope to see a gyroscope, an atomic gyroscope issued from the work in Maximal going into cars. This is our dream. So with that, I would like again to thank our first three speakers uh, we are finished with part one. Um...